Hello and welcome to another edition of In Theo Radio, where we talk about shamanism and very spooky things. Welcome to the Halloween special 2019. This is your captain, captain of the undead pirate ship. <laughs> Huge <laughs> new alchemy here with Rain Grant. Hi, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to mm. come across your goodness. Yeah, you got some good stuff up there. I'm excited. Oh, yes. And so you yourself, let's see, you are, um, you're an artist. You are creating various forms of art and uh, you're a writer, you're a poet, you're a painter, you're a photographer, a videographer, a musician, a cook, a mother, a witch, and a fungophile. What else can I say? Indeed. Gosh, that's quite a mouthful when you say it like that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, um, lover of the planet, humanitarian, you know, uh, it all ties into humanitarianism for sure. Everything that I do. <sighs> Some of your amazing stuff, you can find it on Rain Grant. Spell your name for everyone dot com. R A Y N E R A Y N E Grant, uh, Rain Grant dot com. And uh, I've got a lot of stuff going on, like a lot of irons in the fire. The way I found you is because you're doing something called um, a fungal documentary, Can Mushrooms Save the Planet? Indeed, indeed. Yes, Can Mushrooms Save the Planet? Let's see if you can even see this. This is, <laughs> this is one of my old magnets, but I found it on my, you know, I've got a bunch of them on my refrigerator and I was like, I got to have something to show you. <laughs> but yeah, you can find me on Facebook, uh, my Can Mushrooms Save the Planet page. Um, I've got nearly 11,000 likes, which is not a lot in comparison to some things out there, but it's all grassroots and, uh, yeah, really good to see that people are interested in the topic of using fungi to help our planet. Absolutely. I'm noticing you have a collection of interesting books in the background and two of them, but pop, um, from the camera angle is, uh, by Rick Strassman, DMT, the spirit molecule and... I think that's the second book in his series, DMT, the, what is it, the molecule or something of untold religion? I forgot. So entheogens are very interesting to me, but I have just started diving in because in my studies uh, of fungi and all the multifaceted things about them, the most, like when I mention mushrooms and how they can help save the planet, whatever that means, most people think, tripping they're like are you tripping like what are you what, what are you on you know and i'm like oh i'm not really studying psychedelics and so i have um it's taken a while before i dove into that topic although i've always been interested in such things i have studied many other things um previous to that and so within the last year i just started diving into uh fungi and uh, not not that that was the first experience but but I decided that I wasn't really, I was, I was more interested in mycoremediation and mushrooms as a medicine, you know, treatments for cancer and things like that. Uh, what, what people are doing with fungi to help um, remediate and clean up and, and things like that. But, um, but I have shown a lot of it, like, I'm really interested in entheogens in general. I just, I just started a, um, a chapter of the psychedelic club in the Durango, Colorado area. And um, my specialty is, is in the fungal department, but now I'm starting to just kind of dive into a lot of them because they're all tied in, you know? And a lot of these books cover many, many topics within the entheogenic uh, realms. But I would assume that you would know a lot more about entheogens than I. So I feel like I'm a baby at some of these things. The, the book behind you, the blue title, DMT, is that the, the soul of prophecy? I forget, I'm trying this to remember. This is the, the molecule. I see the spirit molecule. Look, go to your left in the other stack, top, um, towards the top. Um, yeah, yeah, this is his other one. Look at that. So this is and the soul of prophecy. Yes. Yes. Um, and so I have been collecting books. Sometimes people give me books. I acquire them in different ways, sometimes magically. <laughs> but um, but I have not. I have read bits and pieces of, um, of all of these books, but not all of them. But these are some of the books in my library that I decided to take, take and put, put here just so you can see. But um, yeah, there's just some of the books that I've been diving into, we'll just say. 
So I'm feeling a little bit of a, a stir, perhaps some witch put a spell on me or something. And I, I kind of want to know when you got your black hat, how you got your black hat, how did you become mm. such a nature girl and, and get involved with these uh, spooky things? Spooky things. You know, spooky is a relative term, I suppose, right? We get spooked by things we don't know a lot about. People get spooked by taboo topics and witch, witchcraft and things like that may be one of those things because people think about evil spells and things like that. When, actu when in actuality, just being connected to the divine and connected to our mother earth is really where the power is, if you want to say, just tapping in and being in that divine flow is really where it's at. Now, there are, if you want to get into uh, spells and things like that, that's, you know, it's, it's a little off topic, but um, <laughs> I've definitely been uh, very interested in plant medicine and things like that since I was about six, seven years old. My mother had an herb garden and she had uh, a book called Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. And I remember being about 10 years old and just like really just reading the heck out of that book. Like it was amazing to me. Um, and I can't say that I agree with all of Jethro Kloss's uh, points, perspectives. You know, I, I can't imagine that I would agree with any person on every single thing, but, but definitely I've been very interested in using plants to heal people, even just from minor scrapes and bruises uh, to illnesses and whatnot. And uh, so since I have started diving into fungi specifically, I I realized that they are incredibly powerful. And, and I'm just talking about like the enzymes that they produce, things like in shiitake or, or reishi or any number, when we get into the red belted polypore, or any of these understudied mushrooms too. But then we start diving into the psychedelics and how they interact with the brain, not just psychedelics, but nootropics in general. And uh, I am incredibly, incredibly interested in brain health slash nervous system health because that's really what drives us all and and um in our cognitive abilities and in our just being healthy you know having a healthy perspective is the first step in um and being healthy overall you know so yes brain health is very important absolutely so i'm very excited about your uh our private conversations about amanita muscaria and i know you're just kind of peeking into the the world of magical mushrooms and it seems like you're also very connected with the entheogens um, mainly personal experimentation or uh, was marijuana your thing for a while because it's colorado um, <laughs> yeah, we're in colorado here so we've got a lot of uh legalization of things like marijuana is, is, is really beautiful herb. I have, I have smoked that for a while. Um, I don't smoke it every day. Um, I like to be clear minded. Um, and it's not always that clear when I'm smoking, you know, I've got a lot of friends that smoke morning, noon and night, and that's just, you know, that's not my personal thing, but that can be hazy in comparison to some of these other medicinal mushrooms, uh, entheogenic and not affecting the brain and causing major clarity and, uh, you know, heightened focus, you know, the ability to focus and things like that. And that is um, very interesting to me. Um, I, I did start taking hallucinogenics when I was about 17. I know that uh, 18 years old. And I, I dabbled in some of the chemicals like LSD. And I found that I could only reach a certain level and that was not what I was looking for. I was looking for expansion. I was looking for some kind of spiritual connection and the chemicals weren't really doing it for me. And, and um, so then I, I started taking the, uh, well, psilocybin, um, specifically psilocybin based mushrooms. And uh, I, that's where I came up with, I wanted to go by my middle name, Rain. And I was like, yes, at 17, I was like, Rain. And so I've been Rain since, since I had that, realization, but it still wasn't doing it for me. So I started practicing Tai Chi, like uh, standing meditations and whatnot, and realizing that energy flow and balance within the body was 
almost just as clear, like I was gaining some of the same insights even more so just by being a clear person, uh, not drinking the alcohol, not um, smoking all the time, but just being clear and then hiking and getting up into the mountains and just being one with nature. And I went a number of years without doing any entheogens, like nothing, nothing at all for over, over a decade. And so I was really starting to get that calling, especially when I started studying fungi again. I was like, gosh, I really want to, I would like to have an experience. And um, I had never been in a ceremony type of situation. It was always like a party drug or something, you know, people would get together and, and take it and everybody's just having a good time. And that is one place and one space to do it. It's good to commune with people and it's a beautiful thing. I'm not, I'm not saying, cause some people say it's one way or the other, you know, I just, I'm the type of person that thinks that there are many ways to the same destination. It's just a matter of, of, of what you choose. But um, when I moved back to Colorado, because I had moved down to Austin, Texas for a while to pursue singing, sing my, my, my musical career and was raising my family there. When I moved back to Colorado, I, uh, I tried mushrooms again and it was like, whew, just, it was, I don't know, I was just having major realizations. And it's amazing what these mushrooms, I didn't really fully understand now that I'm starting to study them that now I kind of understand the chemical processes in the brain and whatnot and what's going on but they really do open up a segue or a window to other dimensions, but just like greater understand, it just, it, just, it just opens you up for greater understandings of things, greater connection, greater understandings. And um, keep me on track here, I'll, ra I'll ramble on. <laughs> In fact, let's dive deeper into that. Let's dive into Herisium, the lion's mane mushroom, and uh, talk a little bit about why that's just brand new kind of in the public's point of view and and why that is potentially great medicine and i think it's a potential psychoactive in a certain quantity or with a certain biochemistry well that's an interesting perspective um yeah it probably does open up because it's opening up it's opening up neural pathways it's it's causing uh new connections uh protecting your uh the mylar sheath and 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 opening up new new pathways for those electrical currents in your brain but i don't yeah that's where that's where like paul stamets talks about stacking your mushrooms which means taking multiple mushroom medicines at the same time and so lion's mane uh, is being studied in conjunction with uh, with psilocybin or psilocin the psychedelic mushrooms and uh and then what Paul Stamets says is to add niacin to that in order to have that flush and bring the mushroom medicines to your nerve endings, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm very intuitive as well as I, I look at the scientific data, but I'm also incredibly intuitive about things. Like I feel things out and some things come to me in dreams and things like that that's not so scientific it's a little more spooky you know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're gonna talk. Spooky, yes but um the lion's mane is a really good one for uh neurogenesis and that's not just within the brain we're talking about the nervous system um everything in your body is connected through the nervous system and so it is my understanding that utilizing these various mushrooms in conjunction with the other medicines are are going to be it's going to vary from person to person, but my personal experience is that it's really helping. And I have some other mushrooms that I feel are very important in the whole cognitive arena, the whole, like the whole nervous system. Um, because we're talking about eyesight and audibility and you're able, you know, your ability to move and function, all of it's tied in together. And so if you have a healthy brain, you're going to, most likely be healthy in the rest of the scenario. Um, but lion's mane's getting a lot of a lot of press right now, okay? Because it is a legal mushroom, it's a food product, it's easy to grow yourself, and it grows all over the world, right? So I can understand why that's really, you know, why people are focusing in on that one. And it's it's delicious. It is delicious. Yes. But there are other mushrooms that are amazing like there, there are some people that are talking down about chaga for some re for some reason 
and I, I understand where they're, where they're coming from. You know, it's not as uh, available. It's hard, you, you know, cultivating it, so you're not going to get the same results. So you have to go out and wild harvest it. But there's a lot of really interesting research about chaga, and I really feel strongly about mixing your chaga with some of these other psychedelic medicines. And chaga specifically is really good for the, for the pineal gland, for the frontal lobe, but for the pineal gland and the release of these different chemicals that help balance our moods, our sleep patterns, and things like that. And it seems like all these medicinal mushrooms do that as well, but chaga is an interesting thing. It's really high in melanin. And so melanin is what protects our skin from the radiation of the sun. Melanin helps us to balance the mel melatonin and whatnot in our brain. And melanin is what makes our skin dark. It's interesting. But, but the chaga itself has the highest concentration uh, um, in nature of melanin. And I find that to be highly, um, uh, well, it's sacred, but I think it's important. I do. I think it's important in the whole uh, realm of things, including, yeah, and some other of these other mushrooms as well. But yeah, chaga, psilocybin, Amanita muscaria. Well, I'm going to run so, out and, and go buy some chaga. <laughs> right? Yes. Do it, I haven't do had it. chaga in a while, actually. It's been part I of crave it. mushroom blends, but you, so you crave it. Wow. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a white chick trying to be uh, not so white chick. <laughs> really? Why do you I don't know. It? Why do you crave it? Um, well, I notice that my body feels really good when I'm on it, okay? Like if I take it daily, I feel heightened energy, heightened mm -hmm. awareness. I first tried chaga when I was pregnant with my last baby. This is about five plus years ago. Uh, a gentleman sent me a box full of his tinctures, um, Chaga Nation. I'll give him a shout out, Chaga Nation. Nice. And he does not sell to people unless he feels like the medicine is going to do them good. He will not sell to the general public. He's wow. very elite in this. But I started taking it and I, within the first week, noticed a difference, like a huge difference in my ability to focus and my uh, clear minded, like being way clear, more clear minded about things. And um, so I was like, what is this stuff? I didn't even know what it really was. <laughs> I was like, okay, chaga, it's weird. It looks really weird growing on the side of a, a tree. It looks like a cancer sore or something weird. So yeah, some of these mushrooms are odd, but that one's a really odd one. And we have something that grows like that here in Colorado. It looks very different. I mean, it's, it looks very similar. It's, a, it's, on a, it's on the aspen tree as opposed to the birch tree. Oh. And it grows, it grows pretty prolific here. And it's this burl on the side of these um, aspen trees. And I, I was gifted some of it and I've tried the tea and it makes a very dark tea, just like chaga. It's, you know, the, the burl accumulates all the medicinal properties of the tree into that. Not that it's taking it all, but it's like accumulate. It's like, it's like a super, super food, but um, yeah, it's accumulating it or hyper accumulating all the medicinal properties of the tree into that canker or burl. And um, I mean, the aspen burl has not been studied very much. And so there are a lot, you know, we're still learning a lot about mushrooms and mycology and things like that. It's very, a very young science in the realm of uh, our current understanding. Absolutely. And, and maybe, maybe the mushroom medicine will make us remain young as we continue to study this, this science so that we get enough information about it in one lifetime. Right. Well, like the Amanita muscaria is, um, well, see, some of these different mushrooms have nicknames, you know, like reishi is the mushroom of immortality. But what I was looking at with the Amanita muscaria is it has a couple of nicknames. There's the, it's called the herb of immortality which is odd because it's not really an herb, right? I guess it's your, what your, uh, what is your understanding of what an herb is? But, um, it's also called, um, yeah, the herb, it's called, it's called the mushroom of immortality by certain people. And I wonder why they call it the immortality. There's no way we're going to live forever in these bodies. So if you're a listener and you're hearing rain speak, Amanita muscaria is the red and white Christmas time looking mushroom. We see it in fairy tales and, and Christmas cards and it's those Christmassy red and white colors. 
that's what she's really about. beautiful really beautiful mushroom one of the prettiest ones that i've seen and uh, it gets a really bad rap um people are really afraid of uh well i mean amanita the genus of amanita has some deadly mushrooms within that you know within that schema thing so it makes sense that people would be wary or careful but you know it's it's to a point where people are like actually afraid of it and even when you present new information people still want to hang on to that Ooh, you could die <laughs> if you have if you eat it and it's just not true yeah. it, i mean I tried to find some fatality information. Like I looked for fatalities with the Amanita muscaria. Please, if anyone has any information, contact me. If you found any fatalities in conjunction with Amanita muscaria, because I want to know. I found something, I think it was from the 1700s. I want to say it was the 1700s. This gentleman who was collecting mushrooms ate a bunch. Now this is the thing is it's in the record. They don't know if it was he that died or his wife that died. Okay, number one, that's kind of odd that they don't know which one it was. And number two, there's not any real evidence as to which mushroom they were actually consuming. So that was the closest thing to a fatality that I was able to um, dig up on the Amanita muscaria killing someone. Now, it has hospitalized people because if you take a ton of this, you know, I mean, there are constituents in it. And I wrote a bunch of this stuff down to make it a little more, I don't know, palatable but in scientific terms, you know? Um, but yeah, there are constituents in the, in the Amanita muscaria that can be toxic. And if you were to OD on it, you might find yourself in the hospital. But I, but I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen any fatalities surrounding this yet. Yeah, usually what isn't it? Like uh, violent sickness, throwing up, um, diarrhea, stuff like that? Yeah, if you take too much of the, uh, yeah, if you, if, okay, so. Yes, you get you get the sweats, you get nauseated, you might get the runs, but you're not going to die, unless you get oh, what? I guess you could. Uh, well, speaking of, I'm going to drink some water. You could, you know, with any if you get diarrhea, you better drink lots of water. You know. Yeah. But, oh. <laughs> so if you're watching and you see this video, you'll see my earrings. These are the Amanita muscarias on my ear. Yay! Are those real ones? No, they're just a oh, artistic creation. I have some real ones here I wanted to show you. Oh, please. Oh, and they smell so good. Do so they these smell mushrooms. Like, fish, like in the Bible? <laughs> they are like, they're my little fish. No. <laughs> yeah. um, this year was an amazing year for Amanita muscaria as well as the King Bolit in, 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 uh, in Colorado, our porcini, our local porcini. But, um, you know, and so this is just a, a pretty little specimen. It's got the red with the white and the underbelly. It's got the veil still attached to it even. Oh my gosh, that's so pretty. Um, I've, I've got a big bag of them and I've got small ones. I've got, th this is about, this is kind of a small one, but they're really pretty and they smell amazing. They, they make me salivate when I smell them. Okay, like my mouth is like, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna just taste that. Wow, here mm. she is. Mm. This is the wild woman of the mushroom. forest. I just ate it. Just On a little show, bit. ladies and gentlemen, she's eating a mushroom. <laughs> People are like running and screaming in the streets about. It's not yeah. illegal. It's and the great thing about what you're talking about, this mushroom has never been uh, considered an illegal substance, right? Well, um, most places it is not legal. The only place that I could find that it is illegal is in the Netherlands. So if you reside in the Netherlands, it is illegal to own over five grams of it, okay? And five grams and under is a microdose. So if you have like a microdose worth, you're probably safe in the Netherlands. <laughs> but the Netherlands. just be careful. The Netherlands. In the Netherlands. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's a place where uh, a lot of weird stuff is banned. A lot of things that I consider legal highs um, are banned, and it's uh, actually Louisiana. So I'd be curious oh. to know if the state of Louisiana has banned Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Uh huh. Let's I give, didn't know that. Let's give our listeners a few more names of this weird mushroom. This yeah, trippy weird. Well, I'll give you the Japanese name. Tell me what the Japanese name is. It's like the gem. No, that's the, the gem studded Amanita, I think is the Amanita pantherina. 
Yes. Which is very similar. Yes. And I've found those in New Mexico, in the mountains, in Cuba, New Mexico, actually. Oh. And I found those, those whorls on the, uh, was it the aspen trees up in uh, Arizona in the White Mountains on the Mogollon Ridge. Oh, I didn't know they grew under aspen. They usually grow in conjunction with, uh, well, I've heard that they grow near birch in different areas, but here in Colorado, we, they, they grow around the spruce trees. No, not, not amanitas. I'm talking about those whorl things, uh, the chaga-like ones. Oh, yeah, the burl ones on the, on the, yeah, on the aspen, yes. yes. So I didn't I need to know that. I'll, I'll have to pick some of those Arizona ones if I get up there. Do, do, because, um, there was this one gentleman, his name is Manny, okay, um, I can't remember his last name, but he was one of the founders of the uh, Telluride Mushroom Festival, and I found out that he was writing a book specifically about the Aspen Burl because he really felt strongly about it, but he passed away recently, and so I don't believe he actually um, finished that, and I am interested about his research. I want to I, I know, I think his wife is still alive and I'm considering reaching out to her. Yeah, you two ladies could finish it. Right? Yeah. Sure, I love that idea, especially if we're all witches now. <laughs> oh, yes. Hey, so I got to ask you about the Telluride mushroom thing, uh, the festival there, but I'm going to pause and put that on the table. I want to talk about the Tangutaki. So we're still mm -hmm. talking about these, these little Amanita muscaria mushrooms. They're also in Japan called the Tangutake. And not, my Japanese is actually better than most Americans. I'm not fluent, but I did take several uh, classes on it. And then I do use it pretty weekly in Aikido classes. Uh, tangutake, so we hear about shiitake and, and things like that. Take is the reference to the mushroom. Okay. Shi in shiitake means like wood or oak, kind of like the mushroom that grows on wood. So there's the shiitake. So that's how they're labeling that. Tengu in Japanese actually refers to a demon. A demon? A, a wild forest dwelling leprechaun-like creature with a big nose and a red face. Huh. That's I mean, very similar to Santa Claus or something like right, that. Right, right. A kind of wild sort of uh, anthropomorphized version of the Amanita muscaria. Very interesting. I need to know more about this. Yeah, so Tengu. Look up the Tengu. Uh, um, I think also the other reference might be like a dragon, a red dragon of some kind. Huh, yeah, I'm definitely going to look into that. Which if you look at like Milton in medieval uh, kind of dark age alchemy, you see that the red dragon reference is all over the place. And so it makes me really wonder how many people were experimenting with Amanita medicine and using the red dragon reference. That's very interesting. And I don't see why, why that wouldn't necessarily be the case. I, I like that correlation and it looks like, yeah, it sounds like more research needs to be done. What I'm finding is with some of, like specifically with the Amanita muscaria, a lot of the old knowledge has disappeared, like it's gone. Right. So we don't have a lot of history to go by. And, and I think it's really important to look at some of these indigenous cultures and how they utilized the various mushrooms and plant medicines. And so when we have something as powerful or as iconic as the Amanita muscaria, and then we'd have very little histor historical um, evidence or, you know, history on this thing, it, it's, it's like, where is it at? Or can we relearn it or unearth it in some way? Mm -hmm. But what I did find out about the, um, like specifically the Siberians um, and, and what during Stalin's era, you know, when Stalin was doing his massive murders and things. Um, huh. So it, it, in Siberia, the shaman ate the mushroom in order to see visions and whatnot. That wasn't the only re thing that they used it for, but the shamans ate it, you know, heavy doses of, of it. And then they would see their visions and they would say that they could fly. And so I guess Stalin's men would take the shaman who were under the influence of Amanita muscaria and they were load them into the plane, take them up and open the door, the hatch and say, oh, this makes you fly. And they would shove them out wow. of the plane to their death. And so according to Lawrence Millman, Larry Millman, he studied, he's an um, ethnomycologist. Right. He, he was talking about 
how even when you talk to the locals there or mention it, even if they don't know a lot about that, they still like will like, you know, get wide eyed, afraid looking. And he and um, he even says it might be a genetic memory at this point. People don't want to talk about it. And there's a lot of trauma surrounding this particular mushroom. It's kind of like witch which, burning. Yeah. <laughs> Shaman chucking witch burning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something like that. It's, it's a, so that's unfortunate that we've lost a lot of that information. Um, but that doesn't mean that all is lost, that all is lost, you know. So in, in that tradition, the Laplanders over there in Siberia, the name is uh, Mukhamor. Mukhamor mm -hmm. mushroom. Mukhamor. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm not sure which, I think it's the Tungha. I think that's how they call it. I don't know the name of the, the language, but Mukhamor. Yeah, Mukhamor. I'd have to watch watch some more Larry Millman, you know, yeah, <laughs> look yeah. through some of my, my interviews I've videoed. I got a good interview with him, but yeah. Um, the Chim, the Chimchuk or the, Ch oh, I don't want to say their names wrong. There are a lot of tribes over there, but, um, but definitely it's, uh, it, it's still, it's still an important mushroom in their culture and they typically will give it to the older people, like the old people in order to help with, pain you know aches and pains and it helps to raise their um it's interesting because when you drink this tea it makes you really sleepy at first but then when you if you've taken a heavy dose you go to sleep and then when you wake up you're like all right i'm ready to go and it gives you a lot of energy so it's good for vitality it's also good for sexual um uh, issues and whatnot it's an aphrodisiac but it's also kind of like cordyceps oh. it uh it enhances sexual desire is what, what, what people say. And I, and I have, uh, I've seen that firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yay. Hooray. <laughs> that, exciting. that might even be a whole show unto itself. Uh, we're going to table that. I heard a, a, a reference to the zombie mushroom. Cordyceps. Cordyceps. Let's table that for later. Okay. Let's do that. Cause it's a, it's a really interesting topic for sure. So these uh, these fly agaric mushrooms are, are are Amanita. That's another name. They call it the fly agaric. And maybe you got some names that are related to flies and, and killing flies or something like that, right? Yes. Um, you know, if you take this mushroom and you put boil it in milk uh, in Russia, it was tra it's tr still traditional to this day to set out that milk with the Amanita muscaria in it, and it attracts flies. They'll they'll go into the uh, into the liquid and drown. So, you know, I don't think that's one correlation with the fly agaric. The other correlation with fly agaric is that, you know, these the shaman would say that it caused them to fly, but also the reindeer and other types of creatures will eat this out in nature. And there's a whole documentary about the flying reindeer. And well, I'm having a knock on my door. What's okay. up? What's up? Yes, he can go to Charlie's yard and pick apples. <laughs> the joys of parenthood. You can go over there if it's okay with the neighbors, okay? Okay. Well, it's Halloween, they better, are they getting dressed up? They are. We're going to go, we're going to go uh, walk around Durango and, you know, do the trick-or-treating thing. Go see my mom. Oh, very nice. Wow. Kind of anti candy, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> me too. Hopefully, there's a deal that is made at the end of the night. <laughs> one, one that's in my favor, right? No. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Right. The, the hey, I'll give you a free ride to the soy store and ten dollars to spend if you give me your bag of candy, kind of deal. Give me that bag of candy. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> I oh made, made that deal with my son when he was seven, and uh, oh, somehow, that worked for you. somehow he got both ends of that deal. Like he got the reward, and then he somehow figured out where I hid the candy bag, and he got that too. Smart boy. Yeah. Smart boy. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's a little bit of a a fun handful. Oh, that, that's the best kind. That's the best kind. Yeah. I mean, look at his dad, right? <laughs> he's got a, he's got a, you know, he's reflecting you, you know? We were a little crazy. We were a little crazy in that household. 
No, no, we're just, we're just having fun. <sighs> fun is a really important thing, you know, enjoyment of life. And, um, and, and, and being in your gratitude, you know, and, and one thing that I have noticed about some of these psychedelics, specifically the Amanita muscaria, but also microdosing with the psilocybin, is that it causes these feelings of joy. Like you just feel so connected and it just brings you to the present. And I, you know, and sometimes we forget that, not that we should need a substance in order to feel these things, but it's definitely, it helps to align us. And it, it's almost like muscle memory or something like that. In, in some of these cases, I, I do believe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Muscle memory, even I would go so far as to call it genetic memory. Mm, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Some of the genetic where memories. were we? We were talking about the flying mushrooms. The fly, oh my God, reindeer, they seek out the mushroom. They not only seek out the mushroom, but if I, I heard if, if someone pees, the pee smells like enough to where the reindeer will follow the urine smell. Yeah, it's reindeer, like as in the deer, not reindeer, you know. <laughs> sorry, hey. sorry, bad joke. Um, <laughs> so um, We'll do a Christmas are, special with reindeer. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. We'll just have a special every holiday. I like it. Good. I I'll, like I'll dress like skinny Santa. You can be reindeer. Skinny Santa. Poor Santa. Oh. <laughs> he can't work year round. You gotta give him a break sometimes. Yeah. He's on a fast this year. <laughs> and just Amanita muscaria. No. no. Yeah. Or the urine thereafter. So tell us about the urine so, thereafter. So yeah, so Amanita muscaria has some different chemicals in, in it that are processed by the liver and the kidneys. And um, so <clears throat> we have what's called ibotenic acid, which converts into muscimol. So in this mushroom, um, we have ibotenic acid, muscimol, and muscarine, right? Muscarine. Um, <laughs> body processes it. Okay, so if you were to eat one of these raw mushrooms, you would have a lot of ibotenic acid, and that's what makes you feel sick. Okay, because the body can only handle so much. But what happens is, is when you take take it into your body and you urinate when you when you pee, your body processes this uh, these substances and converts the ibotenic acid into muscimol. Muscimol is what causes the relax, re relaxation and the, and, and the hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic pro has the hallucinogenic properties in it. But um, yeah, the shaman, you know, they would eat it and other people, their followers would drink the, the urine of the, the shaman. Also the shaman would go out and collect the urine of the deer that would consume this mushroom because it would have less of the ibotenic acid it have more it would have more of the muscimol um you know and to each their own you know <laughs> different traditions all right do it uh -huh. um but um but it's, it's interesting uh it's also looked kind of down upon in our culture because it's weird you know it's a little weird what the the urine drinking or what drinking drinking the, the deer urine and what i was just reading about is how all of the at one point, many of the hunters would have a little container on their belt at all times in order to collect the urine just in case they came across them. Because if they came across um, a <laughs> deer peeing or a reindeer peeing, they would collect the urine right there on the spot. And I, I don't really understand how they did it or, you know, uh, yeah, it can only go so far in my mind. I'm like, hmm, interesting. I, I mean, you're, you're a videographer. Let's go do it. Let's do this. Let's go over to do this. reindeer urine. <laughs> Go to Siberia. I think someone already did. You know, I, I, I watched that, that documentary or part of it because there's only parts of it available online. But, um, you know, it, it, I, it, a better version could be done, maybe. <laughs> you can be behind. I'll do it. I'll collect the deer urine. It's You'll do the better. urine. It'll be better to drink it warm anyways. Right? Well, I don't know. Maybe chilled is good. I, I don't know. Over some ice. I, I don't know. I'm not a pee drinker, but <laughs> <laughs> there are other ways to decarboxylate this stuff that doesn't require you chasing let's, let's down. Let's talk here. about that. Let's decarb without pee. And, and I and I will say I had a really interesting experience this past summer. 
up in the mountains while I was collecting. I was, I was looking for any edibles, but what kept being shown to me in profusion were the Amanita muscaria. And everywhere I was walking, and I did c catch a bunch of video of this too. And I took my kids with me and we were like collecting and all, beautiful Amanita muscaria, but it would have like a big bite taken out of it. And I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. Like the deer in our area eat, eat, eat it. But some of these bites were pretty big. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if the elk are, are also consuming this uh, mushroom. And uh, as we were collecting, all of a sudden, one of my sons, my 12 year old, is like, mom mom moose <laughs> and i'm like and there were these two male moose in the in this area where a lot of the amanita we were like working our way up there in, in the meadows and uh and i'm like oh my gosh i had to get this shot and this uh this moose looks back at me and they were obviously not afraid but i didn't feel fear like i didn't feel like i didn't feel like i was threatening them and i didn't feel threatened by them but then i realized it was the moose that were eating the Amanita muscaria up there. And I'm like, I don't know. I was blown away. I found it to be incredible, like just powerful, just their being in their presence, but knowing that they were, they were the ones eating these Amanita muscaria and they're huge. These, these animals are huge. They're huge. Yeah. They're like, so it was really powerful. And I was like, or something. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I found that to be really, I don't know, like, I, I mean, I hear about, you know, in Siberia, the reindeer eating these mushrooms, and I just found it to be just spectacular, finding the moose out there, and they, they were the ones, Maybe they were taking Maybe relatively some cheap to go find a moose and collect urine. I, yeah, I'm not going to collect any moose urine. Mm -mm, those guys, I heard, my son told me, he's like, they're more aggressive than sharks, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll leave them alone. They can have Okay. They can eat as much as the of the Amanita muscaria as they would like. Actually, but, uh, I I will I will nix my idea for winter vacation to visit moose. <laughs> That's summer summertime. Oh, moose are active <laughs> in the summertime. I thought Amanita only goes off um, starting after late summer in the fall and then into winter. <clears throat> well, in Colorado, we have a pretty small window of when things grow, um, mm. and we're looking at summer fall and you know, winter. It's covered in snow, so yeah, I, summertime. You summer. think you don't think they pop up through the snow? There's some stories about how uh, in the dead of winter in Siberia, which is more northern than uh, where you're at, uh, they would go up the chimney of their little the the you know the natives would go up the chimney of their little uh, yurts, and then they would be snowed in, and they'd go collect these Amanita muscaria mushrooms out out in the snowy weather, and then they would drop back down the chimney with their Big red so the, the information I could find on that was that uh, the shaman that, that had the Amanita muscaria, it was collected in the summer and fall months, mm -hmm. and then they would dry it, and then they would bring it. But, uh, but yeah, this mushrooms aren't going to grow in the snow. I did try to find information on that because, you know, mushrooms, they need certain temperatures and yeah, things like yeah. that. And, you know, I have found mushrooms in the snow, but it was only because it had just recently snowed on okay. them. So, so it's, yeah. it's more anecdotal that story than I, yeah yeah I mean they did bring I mean from the sources that I was finding uh, they did bring the dried mushrooms to the people and they make teas out of them and whatnot but you have to dry them in order to decarboxylate them and I can get um, more into the details of all that whenever the time is right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, do it now. Depart, de, de, get us, get us on a topic other than, um, and then mushrooms and pee. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I know it's such a weird story and the whole like thing with Santa Claus and whatnot. I tried to find as much information as I could about that because there are people who are super naysaying, and I just like to look at all the data. So yeah, Santa uh, Claus. Well, before Santa we leave Claus. the the arena of urination, let's. Let's talk about how many times the urine can be reuptaked, because I heard it was seven times. You know, it might be seven times. I know it's several times, and I haven't tested it, so. Yeah, and, and that might have been something <laughs> that was stated in a book I read uh, by Clark Heinrich called uh, Mushrooms um, in Alchemy and Religion. Okay, yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of it. And so they're using that that holy number of seven to sort of associate with the Christian traditions. Sure, that makes sense. That makes sense. 
And a lot of these, uh, yeah, when you're dealing with alchemy and, and uh, energetic things, not just like the scientific stuff, uh, your numbers do play a part of all of that and the vibration and whatnot. So um, yeah, I have to wonder about that. I haven't seen any scientific data on that. <laughs> A vast G listeners, we're setting sail from the land of urination to decarboxylate the next subject. <laughs> Going from urination to decarboxylation. Yes. You know, decarboxylation is known really well amongst people who uh, deal in the realms of marijuana. You know, you decarboxylate your uh, marijuana in order to create more THC and CBD. So basically decarboxylation is just a, a form of heating a substance and then it changes the chemical structure into something else, right? It mm -hmm. causes certain parts of the molecule to burn off and it changes it into something that's more accessible by the body. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so when we're talking about Amanita muscaria, Amanita muscaria is highly revered in many different cultures, but also some of the more recent uh, religious groups, like the, um, what was it, what were they called? The, the Ambrosia Society. Have you heard of them? I'd like to. Um, yeah, so they're, uh, I don't want to call it leader, but they did, they, they're kind of a little bit cultish. You know, I, I met Donald Teeter the guy who uh, wrote the wrote a book. What was the name of that book here? He gave me a copy of it too. It's a very small book, but you can find it online in a PDF format. All, all good leaders have books. Yeah. Soma is like, yeah, what is it called? What does he call it? Anyway, I'll get back to that because it'll come to me when it's supposed to. Sometimes my brain works in certain linear ways. So anyway, we're going to keep going with it. But anyway, they, uh, they used the Amanita muscaria and they created they believed that the Amanita muscaria was is Jesus, and what in biblical terms they believe that it rises from the dead after three days and all this stuff. And I went and visited them. They they're located right outside of Austin, Texas. I took a trip down there, went and visited those cats, and uh, it was right after Donald had died. Rest in peace, Donald Teeter. But um, they have a lot of really good information to share with me, and they're very much into like that's part of their religious practice is taking this mushroom. And so, yeah, um, the Ambrosia Society, if you do a search for them, they have a website and then they have a link to their PDF. If you want to learn more about some of their traditions and turning the water into wine and whatnot, <laughs> so to speak. Nice. And then Jesus thing. walks upon the water because the mushroom floats, right? It does float. Yes. Um, and, and unless you boil it, and when I boiled it and took a bath with it, they were definitely not floating. Yeah, they were. You boiled it and took a bath with it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, and that's a, that's uh, an interesting. Do you want to share? Yes. Um, you know, I uh, was researching how it was really good for your skin and the absorption of it in the skin, and I and I, I guess in different. Uh, in different parts of the world. I think in Turkey, I want to say it's in Turkey, they, they, they create like a salve out of it and actually will put it on the genitalia and because it's supposed to absorb um, a lot more through that, the sensitive areas of your body. Now, I have not tried that yet, and it's going to be one of my next things is to create a salve or some kind of lotion uh, out of the Amanita muscaria. And just, just for topical use, you can use it wherever you decide, you know, but um, really good for arthritis, things like that. Um, but yeah, I went ahead and I took uh, 16 grams of dried material, which is way more than a heavy dose, right? And I boiled it. I boiled it for 45 minutes. Now, everybody that talks about the Amanita muscaria, they say boil it for 30 minutes. But all the information I've read about just mushrooms in general, you want to boil it for at least an hour. Depending on the mushrooms, it can be up to like three hours, you know, like if you're dealing with something like chaga. So wow. getting a full extraction, right? And so then I poured it into my bath and I soaked in it for a good hour and a half and um i could definitely tell i could definitely tell but i've also ingested amanita muscaria and so i kind of know what to to look for and uh when you're taking it in small amounts it's bare it's barely recognizable it's hmm. just a enhancement everything feels enhanced everything feels lighter um more joyful just yeah everything has a little bit of a sparkle to it and that's how i was feeling afterwards for several hours just felt really light 
but my skin was so soft. <laughs> I was like, okay, it is good for the skin. It's been used for eczema and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I took a bath in it because I, you know, just because because <laughs> I very, can and I did very for uh, scientific, uh, you know, so we're, I'm, I'm doing a science, scientific experiment here. Um, yeah, it's very, something. it's still very witchy to do that. Sci mm -hmm. Witchy science. Witchy science. <laughs> <laughs> the science of witchery. All right. And, and Amanita muscaria. So Amanita muscaria is very taboo. You know, if I put a picture up online of just finding it in the wild, I will get comments from people saying, be careful, you could die. Oh my gosh, don't touch it. And things like that. Okay. Um, people are very afraid of this mushroom. I'm kind of feeling like I should share a story, and it's it's about my ex, who was a producer on this show. Okay. And, uh, so we deep. I got some Amanita muscaria mushrooms uh, in the mail out here in California, and I I was preparing them by decarbing them. I believe I soaked them, and then I put them in the oven and baked them. So on, you soaked them first. You I soaked them first, and then I baked them. Would you soak them in? Water. Maybe, water. maybe water and alcohol mixture. And then of course the alcohol oh. burned off. So I think it was I think it was a combo. It was definitely not just water now that I think about it. And then so I got this sort of red water that cooked off. I cooked it to the point where it was gummy. I removed the the mushroom material and then I kind of like pressed everything into a glob like a little resinous ball that was left on the on the baking pan and i put that in a little container and i'm like let's go to a burning man event and we have this wonderful medicine and stuff like that and somehow her and i were busy or focused on something else and she had this lovely little doshin that knew exactly what we were up to all the time and it had made a habit out of stealing and eating any psychoactive substance and just about every psychoactive substance that I had ever processed in the house or in the kitchen or in the backyard. And we came back to a missing amount of this Amanita resin and a really barfy dog. The dog oh. took more than was recommended for uh, like what you're talking about. Like it took a huge human dose and it's like a less than 20 pound dog, maybe a 15, 12 pound dog. Oh my goodness. And yacked wow. a lot and was kind of woozy and slept and dreamed a lot and was fine in a day or two. Uh-huh. Poor little thing. Yeah. Oh, vivid dreams i bet it did the dog used to have vivid dreams all the time and, and i think the dog somehow knew instinctively what we were up to because i have maybe in oh, another episode i may have described this but i have processed mescaline and, and i've i've taken that from san pedro cactus and i i took all that remnants that i wasn't using and tossed it and buried it in in like a composted way in the backyard the dog went and dug that up and ate it Oh my God. Wow. And wow. then we, we had mushroom chocolates in my, in my ex's purse once upon a time. <laughs> you know, the like psilocybin mushroom chocolates. Yeah. The dog tore open the bag and the purse and ate the chocolates. Dogs aren't supposed to have chocolate and somehow didn't die from that and was really, really high on psilocybin. So that's the dog's been on muscovol, psilocybin, and mescaline now. And the, wow. the third I like cake was, dog. I got a space cake, one of these um, edibles with THC in it that uh, was way strong, way too strong for me. And I was like, I'm gone for a couple days, just whoa, high. And there was like a second one and I left it in a place that was jumpable, like a dog could jump up and get it, and it it, it ate that too. <laughs> and wow. got really high on weed. Just like, wow. and, and so like the dog really, I think really knew what it was doing, 
because there's right. other things that could it could go after and even with the chocolate it i mean it kind of knows that there's a there's a problem with chocolate causing barfing and and maybe even dog sickness and stuff but it it sort of sought out this this altered state repeatedly in my presence and in her presence whenever we were up to something the dog's like hey hey i know what you're up to i'm going to get it when you're not looking. He wanted to be involved, and he wanted to evolve. <laughs> right. Yeah. Aww. It was an interesting experience, and so that that kind of speaks to the non lethality of of Amanita muscaria on small weighted animals. Yeah, yeah. If it's not going to kill a dog, it's probably. I mean, like a dog is much smaller than us, so. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. It's not lethal. It's not lethal. Um, it's hard on the liver, but it, but it can be processed, you know, the body processes it. You'd have to eat like 10 caps or some, you'd have to eat a really large amount for it to be fatal. Right. And, you'd, and, and, and I don't know who would do that. It would have to be very, um, naive, very naive to do that. <laughs> you're like me. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you're, still, you're still alive. This is I'm good. still alive. <laughs> No, I haven't eaten that many, but I, I would do that. And, uh, and I, okay, so we've talked outside of this show, and I, wanna, I want you now to talk about your, your eating of Amanita experience. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it was, it wasn't, so it wasn't this past summer. It was the summer before. And I, I've been doing a lot of research on Amanita muscaria, and it took me a number of years before I even felt safe um, smoking it because, and that's some, that's a, that's a form of intaking it is smoking it as well. We can get into that, but that's a different story. Um, but I had, um, read about it. Uh, David Aurora talks about how the edibility of the Amanita muscaria being a choice edible hmm. if prepared properly. And, um, you have to parboil it. Everyone says, you know, I mean, there are certain people who are like, oh, you just need to parboil it once. Parboiling it is when you take the mushroom you put it in um, a large amount of water, boil it for like 15 to 30 minutes, you pour off the water, and then what you have left is the Amanita muscaria that, that is supposed to be edible. So David Aurora says to parboil it twice. So I was very excited about this big load, this huge load. I think it was like 40 pounds my, me and my daughter had brought out of the, the, out of the um, woods here in Colorado. And uh, they were just so beautiful. And I was dry, I was going to dry them and prepare them. But I was like, you know what? I, you know, and I had just recently been to a talk for, uh, by Langdon Cook. If you're familiar with Langdon Cook, he's an author out of Oregon, a uh, forager. And he talks about the edibility of Amanita muscaria as well. Okay. So I thought, okay, Larry Evans told me parboil it once. David Aurora said parboil it twice. I'm going to parboil it thrice, you know, and I did it with a little bit of vinegar in it. Supposedly the vinegar helps to, to remove the constituents that are sickening or hallucinogenic. So right. I did that. I parboiled it three times. Then you take that mushroom matter and you slice it up and you saute it in butter and garlic, little salt, just like you would any delicious mushroom. Now I will tell you, this mushroom is delicious. It's very sweet. And then with that salt and butter and the garlic, it's just, it's savory. It's delicious. If you like mushrooms, it's a delicious edible. But I was hungry for this mushroom. <laughs> and I, and I, you ate one during this interview already. Well, it was just a nibble. That's not going to do anything. I'm not going to feel anything from that. But, um, but there was at least five caps that I had sliced up and prepared, and I put it on a plate, and I videoed the whole thing. I was very excited about it. I was like, oh, I'll share, you know, <laughs> with people how the beauty, beautiful aspects of how you can change this from a psychedelic or toxic mushroom into something that is a choice edible, you know, as spoken about by many, you know, by several of our um, – of our experts out there. So I sit down and I eat it and I talk about it because I'm videoing the whole thing. Yeah. Delicious. Mm, and I ate it all up. I think I was really hungry for that mushroom and it was delicious. Well, give it about 30 minutes or so. I started not feeling so good. 
started feeling nauseated. My mouth started salivating a lot, started sweating. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and it was starting to come on real heavy. And I was like, dang, like I did everything that they said to do. I did it three times, you know, but I started feeling really like it was coming on heavy. And so I just, <laughs> I made the decision to go ahead and make myself purge. I went to the bathroom and I made myself vomit. I induced vomiting to yeah. just get it out of my gut. Cause I was like, I could tell, like I had eaten a lot. Whoa. And, and um, I was like, God, I, what is it? You know, I knew, I know that in our Rocky mountains, all of the uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms that we're dealing with are special, we'll say like our chanterelles, we have a special type of chanterelle here, the, you know, Cantharellus roseocanus, and our porcini is, is sp specific to our Rocky Mountains, and I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's probably the case with our Amanita muscaria as well, and I did not know that. <laughs> I just guessed that afterwards, but yeah, and, and I went through the night, um, I didn't get sick after that. I, you know, I was glad that I had chosen to purge because I wasn't really looking to, to, to have that experience, but I was in a safe environment and I just stay hydrated and, you know, I slept really well that night and had vivid dreams and stuff, but, um, yeah. So you have to be kind of careful about this. I, I, I did find out the following year at the uh, Telluride Mushroom Festival um, after speaking with some other um, mycologists, uh, that our species here in the Rocky Mountains is a little stronger, maybe closer to the, the Amanita pantherina, you know, the Amanita pantherina is, is known for being really high in the muscimol and ibotenic acid, and so apparently our Rocky Mountain variety is um, very strong, so just a warning. <laughs> it's not really food great. And I, and I can only imagine if I had uh, eaten it uh, in its full strength, what I had would have experienced. <laughs> but anyway, that's, <laughs> that's my story. Um, yeah. So yeah, be careful. <laughs> know your mushrooms, I feel but even being careful, even uh, taking the precautions and following the protocol, I was still um, yeah, I was tripping. <laughs> I feel like there's a couple of easy life insurance policies that could be sold just uh, listening to this episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mushroom hunters uh, life insurance. Don't tell them, you know, that's what you're insuring for. <laughs> so I, I do this too. Sometimes I'll eat a, a really uh, considered toxic mushroom. And uh, one of my teachers said it was okay to... Uh, parboil the elfin saddles you know the black elfin saddles that are false morels and i oh, okay i've done that a, a few times and no was it problem. Good? yeah it was pretty good um yeah just no problem but they kind of have something that is uh, akin to a, a jet fuel like substance and so you have to open yeah. open fry open boil with water and it cooks them off cooks off whatever's in that black elfin saddle interesting yeah I have you know I have to wonder I have to wonder about these mushrooms that you have to process really heavily in order to make them edible you know like have you heard about our agaricus biforis I'm sure that you have with Paul Stamets had like a Joe was on Joe Rogan's show and he started they started talking about our agaric, agaric, agaricus biforis which is like the mushroom you find in the grocery stores all over the yeah tell me about that that's a little mysterious it is mysterious and i had a lot of people asking me about it and i didn't know the answer because paul stamets said that his life was being threatened when he talked he couldn't talk about it his life had been threatened and apparently um there's another mycologist um who said has said a similar thing uh, peter mccoy was talking about it so i i still talk about it i have not been threatened as of yet and so i when I teach classes, I always mention this because I think it's very strange. Peter McCoy. Peter McCoy. Yeah. Yeah. Rad Mycology. We love him. He's been he's on this show once. Stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah. He's, he's fabulous. I got a really great interview from him at the Mushroom Festival. A couple so tell me, years ago. What, what are you saying? I, I'm not understanding. Someone's so that, that is a mushroom that causes, is, um, it causes tumors. It's, uh, it's mutagenic to our cells. And so I find it very weird that that's the mushroom that is um, the most common one that people eat. 
the uh, portabella, the cremini, and the white button mushrooms are all, uh, they have constituents within them that are mutagenic to our cells. And um, the information that I was able to dig up and find is that you can destroy these mutagenic properties by heating it up, by boiling it. And so they said, so the information I found was like, if you saute it for like five minutes, it kills about 10% of these uh, mutagenic properties. But if you boil it for like two hours, it can remove 90% of it. And I'm like, who wants to boil a mushroom for two hours to remove, you know, then what kind of, I mean, I don't know, like it makes me very, very much question why that is the most common mushroom being eaten wow. by the public. And a lot of that people causes, eat that raw in salads. And that's even worse when it's even stronger than mutagenic properties. And I can't remember what it's called. It's called like um, agara something or other. I'd have to look it up, but, um, but yeah, it's mutagenic. And I'm like, there's so many amazing mushrooms that are like anti-mutagenic, like that protect our cells and uh, combat cancer in various ways. Like why would the mushroom that's the most, you know, known about and eaten and you find it in, um, in every supermarket. Why is that the one we eat? The one that is um, mutagenic. And I don't know, there are people out there that make fun of that, you know, whole thing. I get it. There's me memes out there about it. But I, I choose, I choose not, I mean, I've still eaten it here and there, but I choose not to consume it on a regular basis. I had a microdosing meetup group where I was talking about Paul Stamets' stack um, in San Diego here last couple months ago, maybe last month, I forgot, a couple months ago. And uh, someone brought this to my attention where he won't talk about that in that interview. And I was like, whoa, what, what's that about? And, the, and, you know, the stack and, and the speech he made about microdosing versus the, the Joe Rogan interview, totally different things. But someone brings that up and I, I never really, I never yeah, really could, could put an answer on that until you just kind of did that reveal. My, my theory was that the people that make, that, that produce big amounts of mushrooms, probably like Del Monte or, or something like that, you know, those big food industry people that are somehow connected with Monsanto those people probably were the ones that threatened Paul or any, any mushroom expert that wants to come out with this information about how this mushroom is not super healthy for general consumption. Um, also, I wanted to throw in there that it's probably the most uh, genetically modified mushroom and maybe the only genetically modified mushroom that's available to the public. <clears throat> Well, that's interesting. And the whole genetic mo modification uh, thing is interesting because um, people work with mushrooms and train mushrooms in the laboratory. And I don't know what the genetic alteration is when we're talking about using mushrooms for, for any number of things, uh, uh, remediation projects and stuff. But that, that may, I know people play with the genetics in the lab quite a bit. But um, yeah, I don't know about that mushroom and, and genetic modification of, of sure. it. Sure, I put forth that maybe uh, as an explanation for the reasons why Paul couldn't talk about it, that uh, that could be a patent on that particular set of genetics. Perhaps so. Perhaps it is a patent or something. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather think that it's something like that rather than some conspiracy. You know, I'm not anti-conspiracy theories or whatever, but definitely uh, good to, to keep, it, keep them in consideration. Mm -hmm. I don't know why or whatever, but I, I just, you know, I decided to do a little research and just see what I could dig up on that topic. And it just, it opens up a whole can of worms for me and my questions, you know, and not knowing the answer to that, we can only speculate, you know. So Rain, it sounds like the mushrooms that don't get you high, get you really low. And the mushrooms that do get you high are actually really good for you. <laughs> well, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> Tell us more about getting high on uh, maybe smoking Amanita or, yeah. Yeah, so that brings me back to the Amanita muscaria, and I kind of just put together just a little bit of information to try to keep myself on track, you know, um, as far as the explanation of Amanita muscaria. So I have talked to people about this numerous times, and I am always faced with adversity, unless. Well, no, I wouldn't say always, and I don't like that word anyway, but um, for the most part, people are very adverse to this mushroom. 
So what Amanita muscaria has within it, I mean, it's got a lot of chemicals, but the main constituents are uh, ibotenic acid, muscamol, and muscarine, okay? And I'll get into each of those a little bit. I mean, like very, very briefly, because science is only <laughs> so palatable to, to certain audiences. Sure, yeah. But um, ibotenic acid itself is a neurotoxin, okay? And so just like any glutamate, like monosodium glutamate, it's kind of in the realm of those. And there are people who are very adamantly against MSG, monosodium glutamate, because it is an excitotoxin. It's a neurotoxin, okay? So why would we want to put this in our bodies, right? And so I did a bunch of research on it because I'm like, okay, that's a good point, you know, what's going on with this mushroom, what's going on with these chemicals that causes it to be different than MSG, right? So um, <clears throat> my understanding is ibotenic acid in itself has some properties within it that's good, even though we're trying to, by heating this mushroom up, we are, what we're working at doing is converting the ibotenic acid into more muscimol because muscimol is what we're really looking for when intaking this mushroom. Um, but there's a lot of information out there, but ibotenic acid does have its medicinal properties, okay? So I wanna, but, but what it does is it binds and it binds to what's called the NMDA in the brain. It, um, it, it attaches to the GABA receptors in our brain and allows, like say this is a receptor and this is a receptor and there's like an electric pulse that goes between them, okay? And as things degenerate, we have less of those connections. And so when you take GABA, for instance, which is plant-derived, it does the same thing as ibotenic acid and muscimol. It attaches to those receptors and allows for the, M the pulses to go in between them much more regulated, okay? And it regulates it in a way that calms the system down. Hmm. That's why it's being used in conjunction to like, um, to help suppress seizures and things like that, okay? So I drew up this little thing. I don't know if you can even see it, but this is what yeah. ibotenic acid is, okay? We've got hydrogen and oxygen. We've got nitrogen here and we've got nitrogen and hydrogen. It's basically hydrogen and oxygen. But what happens is when we heat it up, because these are double bonds, this right here is a very, very strong structure, okay? But what happens is when we heat, this is, this is ibotenic acid. When we heat it up, what happens is, is right here, this bond breaks. And then what we have left is muscimol, okay? And this is what muscimol looks like. So it's basically, it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple what it is. Okay. But, um, but the, but the ibotenic acid is what makes our stomach upset and is really hard for our livers to process. So when you have a, when you, if you were to eat a fresh speci specimen of this, it would be very high in ibotenic acid. Um, and you don't want to do that. You want to dry it first. So dry, just drying it alone is going to decarboxylate a certain percentage of it. Um, if you were to put it in a dehydrator or put it in your oven at a very low temperature, you're going to only convert about 30% of the ibotenic acid into muscimol, okay? So that, so you're still, you know, like I nibbled a little bit of, um, of that mushroom, and I did it kind of as a joke, but <laughs> if I were to eat a bunch of it, I would get nauseated. I would get very sick. And, um, but the muscimol itself is what we're really going for here. So you want to boil it. And in that boiling process of at least a half hour, I say to an hour, um, that's when the muscimol, you're gonna have the highest percentage of muscimol, okay? So the muscimol is what's being studied. Like over in Australia, there's a, um, and I should have written it down, the name of the university, but they're studying muscimol in conjunction with MS, and um, epilepsy and different brain and nervous system issues. Because what it does is it allows, you know, it allow, allows these uh, transferences of energy in the brain, but it's like kind of training the brain to, to, to act in these ways, but it relaxes you. It interacts with your brain in a similar way that alcohol does on a low, but, but alcohol is not good for your brain, but it relaxes you, right? It lowers the inhibitions, it relaxes you. 
So on a small scale, that's what the muscimol is gonna do to your body is just cause this calming effect. It lowers anxiety and panic and things like that. So if you were taking it, like uh, microdosing it, wow. um, uh, you, you would start to see a lessening of these, like if you have anxiety disorders and things like that, um, it's being used for that. This, this sounds like a really great time to mention your uh, social media on Facebook because I think your, the link to that study is on your Facebook. I have a lot of links to a lot of these studies, okay? Um, and, I'm, and I'm adding more all the time. But yeah, can mushrooms save the planet? If you type that into any search engine, it's gonna take you to my website as well as my Facebook page. And I am accumulating a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of the science papers and whatnot. Because I think the history and the shamanic uses, usages of this mushroom, as well as any, anything really across the board, I think it's really relative. But we, when we look at the scientific data and research on that, it's, I mean, it's just, it, it basically confirms what has already been known through the ages, you know? But some people really need that scientific research in order to believe it, right? Yeah. And, um, and I think it's all relative. I think it's all relative. But then we have what people are really afraid of is the muscarine, okay? Because muscarine in high dosages could actually kill you. It can be fatal, okay? And so um, well. muscarine, <laughs> muscarine is found in this mushroom, but at very, very low amounts. So you can eat an entire mushroom and not mm. be negatively affected by the muscarine. But from what I understand is that muscarine in itself has certain properties within it that's good for us as well. So this mushroom, even though it's got like toxins, toxins, um, it's all, I, I feel like nature has a, has a way of balancing things. And then through our witchiness and processing things, we can draw out of it more or less of these things, you know, like if you want to poison someone, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh boy. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I won't go there. Right there. But uh, <laughs> we're not we're not poisoning anyone here. We're trying to heal. We're trying to heal. <laughs> uh, uh. But um but so so um there's this one we're light doctor. lady on we're YouTube. Rich, we're rich doctoring. Yeah, witch doctor. Witch doctor. But um but yeah, the uh, muscarine is what causes your, your pupils to dilate, okay? So muscarine, it, uh, it hasn't been used in, in treatment, in certain treatments, but it has been studied because they have, there are certain scientists that are like, oh, maybe we can use this when doing eye exams or something to open up the pupil. What is it called? My, my, meiosis or something like that? I think yeah. it is. But uh, yeah, yeah. So it causes your pupils to dilate. But it's found in a lot of different mushrooms. Like the muscarine is found in our king bolites, the, er, the porcinis that everybody eats. You know, it's in, um, in bolites and in, uh, hygrosabes and lacteri lactarius and, and, and our different rusulas. So this is like a common chemical, but there are certain mushrooms that you want to be really wary of, like um, that are in the Amanita family or genus you don't want to eat like, like our death cap or the destroying angel, for instance, Th those are, those are, have been known to be fatal, but, um, but yes, there is muscarine in the Amanita muscaria, but it's an incredibly low amounts. And so oh. it's, um, I know that's been one of the main concerns when I'm talking to people, they're like, what about the muscarine? You know, and I'm like, well, and so I, I looked it up, but it, but it, but this is an interesting thing about muscarine. It's really good for toning our, um, our smooth muscles in our body. So it has like things that are good about it. So it ha yeah, our smooth muscles. So that's going to be like our gastrointestinal, uh, you know, it's going to cause our gastro gastrointestinal system to run more smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, it helps us with our bladder helping it, you know, it helps tone these muscles. And so I'm like, wow, really? So this toxic, it, you know, so it's, it's interesting, you know, and I don't pretend to know at all, but it's, it's definitely interesting and, and, and is noteworthy, but uh, especially when people are afraid to take these mushrooms. So the thing is, is like, it helps Oh, and the smooth muscle is also in our bronchial system and our breathing, and it helps to slow down our heart lowers the blood pressure but if you were to take like a large amount of muscarine it's going to cause you to have breathing 
issues and things like that. And so, yes, you want to definitely know your mushrooms that you are intaking. Right. So it was that, that was ibotenic acid, muscimol, and muscarine. Yes. And so when you're heating this mushroom up, you are converting, you're decarboxylating the ibotenic acid into more muscimol. Because the muscimol is really what you want to go for when talking about uh, using it as a, um, a brain uh, a tonic, using it in either um, microdosing or, or in full on, you know, full blown dosages. And I, um, <clears throat> people have asked me many times, how do I prepare this? You know, how do I take this into my body? And there are numerous ways. I mean, this is an eight, this is, this has been used for thousands of years. This mushroom has been revered, feared, and forgotten about in a lot of ways, but yet it's, our iconic mushroom, right? It's seen in, our, in a lot of our fairy tales and things. So it's like, if it's so scary, why is it in children's stories? You know, like, I mean, I don't know. I think I find it to be very interesting. And I smoke it. I have found resources. So I, I smoke it, I crumble it up, I dry it, I crumble it up, and I put it in my pipe or my hookah, and I smoke it. And my body tells me when to stop. And um, when you, and, and, and the burning itself is going to decarb, decarboxylate quite a bit. That's my understanding. And so when you smoke it, it is a very, very mild hallucinogenic. I don't even know if you'd really consider it a hallucinogenic because it really doesn't act the same. Like, like when, you, when I think of a hallucinogenic, I think of like, like psilocybin or psilocin or uh, any number like LSD and things like that, where you start to trip out, like you're seeing, you're hallucinating. But um, when you smoke it, it is um, considered, it's, it's referred to as the businessman's hallucinogenic because you can smoke it and be very, and feel very clear, feel very grounded, very clear, very focused. It's completely different. And just everything is just enhanced, but it's not like I'm seeing things. It's not like I'm, you know, there's, there's not the same thing as like DMT or anything like that. It's, I just feel very on top of it and I can go through my day feeling very clear and aware. And yeah, it heightens my awareness of my surroundings. And, um, there are a lot of references to this. Um, I'm not totally, you know, may, it, it took me a while before I even got the nerve to smoke it about three years ago, four years ago. Um, and I did, when I smoked it, I was like, wow. And so I create my own smoke blends. I'll crumble it up, powder it. I'll mix it in with mullein, a little sage, um, a little cannabis, you know, and I'll bless it. I like to do it under the full moon or the new moon, you know, get my witchy out, you know. Yeah. But, um, but I did not know that that was a common, like that is actually a traditional way, a method of intaking it is to mix it with these other herbs. And I, um, I found it, I found a reference to it within, uh, I'll give uh, Robert Rogers a shout out, uh, Fungal Pharmacy, his book. Mm -hmm. He has a whole section on Amanita muscaria, really worth the read, lots of detailed ways to prepare and history involved in this mushroom. Also, David Aurora mentions it, smoking it. But also, if you uh, are interested in aphrodisiacs, there's the Encyclopedia of Aphrodisiacs, and they have a smoke blend recipe in there, very similar to what I was already doing, just kind of intuitively with the mullein and things like that. But it's really nice. It's very mellow. Um, usually when I do a talk or, or whatnot, I, I don't really talk about, I haven't really done a talk on Amanita muscaria. This is my first one. Um, <laughs> but afterwards, I like to smoke people out and talk about the Amanita muscaria and just kind of educate people on it because I think it's a really powerful, beautiful, um, beautiful mushroom. And, uh, it's not really to be feared, you know, definitely be careful <laughs> when gathering it and know what you're gathering, but it's not, if you're, if, you, if it's the Amanita muscaria, it's not as scary as people want to make it out to be. Um, but that being said, I have read about, see, I, I have, I have to do a ton of research before I choose to take action on putting something into my body. I'm very sensitive to chemicals in general. Yes. My, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, I'm a super sensitive person, super sensitive to energy, super sensitive to chemicals in my body. And so when I talk about these things and when I do them, it's with great awareness and feeling the energy of the, what I'm working with. And so I, I, 
it took me a while before I was brave enough to actually drink some of this. Okay. Because I already tried the eating thing. Right. And I was like, Whoa, okay. That was, I thought that I was going to have a nice meal and not have a hallucinogenic experience. But this last week, and after talking to you, um, I, I, I felt really brave. And actually there were a couple of nights that I was like, I really think I'm ready to make a tea out of this. And so night before last, I weighed up three grams and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you what these, uh, let's see. So there is a website that I suggest anyone who is interested in anything having to do with entheogens, go to the Arrowhead Center. They have a website. Uh, they have a ton of information on anything you want to look up, but they are saying that a strong dose is 10 to 30 grams. Okay and that a medium dose is about five to 10 grams. So that means that a microdose is four grams or under. Um, I decided to go with three grams just before I even read that. I was like, uh, you know, I felt it out energetically. I weighed up three grams. I boiled those mushrooms for about a half hour. And, um, and I had actually added a little passion flower to it just because I wanted it to have like some flavor or whatever. Nice. Had my honey and I drank it and I, felt a little bit of it, but it wasn't strong. I felt relaxed. Okay. And I did it right before bedtime too. So I was like, also when, when I go to bed, it's my favorite place to read and research and things like that. So I was just researching and doing things like that. And then I'm like, I just felt really sleepy and I went to sleep. And when I woke up, I felt really revived. I felt really good. Okay. And I was like, but I didn't really feel the effects of the mushroom itself. So last night <laughs> I decided to go with a four gram dose because I, I just want to. So I did it. Right. So I did the four grams. I boiled it just like I said. And um, I also ate a little bit of, um, I do these mushroom extracts and honey. And so I have some lion's mane that I was like eating honey, honey mushrooms, you know? Um, okay. <laughs> so, I want my brain to be on it for this more for today. You know, I was like, I'm going to up my dosage of, of lion's mane, you know, why not? So I ate my lion's mane, Colorado mushroom company. You know, that's my, that's my, that's my mushroom company. Um, and then I did the, the four grams and just drank it in a tea. You know, you don't eat the mushroom matter. Okay. Always strain that off. Um, so I boiled it, strained it off, drank my mix and within about a half hour, because I have a very sensitive sense system, I started feeling kind of almost, almost drunk, okay? And that's what the Siberians talk about, feeling drunk. But I felt very just kind of just relaxed and just kind of silly and giddy. Not, but I wasn't hallucinating. I didn't see any visuals or anything, but I just felt really like, and then as it came on, really strong wave of it, I was just like, could barely keep my eyes open. I was just so drowsy. I could barely, I couldn't control it. And I was like, all right, it's bedtime. So I, I went to sleep and I woke up about 6 a.m. just feeling so alert and so revived. And I felt like I couldn't remember my dreams, but I could tell that I had had some very intense dreams. And Amanita muscaria is known for inducing dream state and helping you to work through issues it, during the sleep process. And I'm like, I, I, I'm ready to do a, a full on dose, but not quite yet. Cause I want to space these things out, allow my body to yeah. kind of integrate and stuff. But I will say that even at the four grams and I'm about 125 pounds, but so, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of light, but, um, and I'm a lightweight but I mean, it, it just made me want to sleep. And so I know that it's good for people who have insomnia and things like that. So this mushroom is not as scary as people want to, want to think that it is. They, uh, anyway, there's a brand, uh, brand that sold mushrooms in Arizona and Tempe, Arizona at happy high herbs or rainbow bliss botanicals. It's called the dream pillow brand. And I don't know if they're still in business, but yeah, they basically, they sold it as dreaming incense. Oh, yeah. When you burn the Amanita muscaria, it smells really good. Like it smells like an incense. It uh, has a similarity in its smell and flavor. Like when I'm smoking it, 
it's not exactly like opium, but there's something about it that reminds me of the of the opium. Now I'm getting a thing saying that my internet connection is unstable, so I don't know what that. It, it's showing that the video feed is actually very uh, skippy and uh, skip skippy. <laughs> Skippy's not good. Glitchy. Skippy's not good unless it's peanut butter. <laughs> or if you're just skipping, you know, out there skipping in the world. <laughs> right. So, but, but yeah. I'm, I'm still but all of this information this that I'm talking about, all of this information, if you want references or anything like that, a good place to go is my Facebook page. I reference. I, I like to reference the science papers, the historical references and all of that, or you can always get a hold of me personally and I can send you a list of um, books and whatnot that I'm uh, getting this information from. Very nice. Um, I really want to get into some of the stuff we tabled, but I'm not sure it's going to be the right time uh, because we've had a really long conversation already. So maybe we'll save that for the overtime or the extras or the uh, fireside chats, as I call them, uh, in Theo Radio Extras, off the record. But mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if you're ever going to be revealing the, the video you took of you bathing with Amanita Muscaria. I probably should. I mean, it doesn't show any nud nudity, you know? I mean, I was nude during the bathing process, but I tried to keep video, you know, shoulders up. <laughs> I <see>. um, <laughs> You're supposed to, like, they're supposed to get people to tune in, so you weren't supposed to tell anyone there's no nudity. I know. <laughs> I mean, there was almost a glimpse of a nipple, but it was just so close, you know? Yeah, it was, a, it was just a mushroom floating in the water. <laughs> it was. I was actually bathing with these mushrooms like I after the extraction I pour the mushrooms into the water and they're all floating and I'm like I'm gonna swim with mushrooms but these mushrooms are so beautiful the um in in the video I do show the gills and opening the gills looks very very feminine it looks very feminine and I, I it is very exciting <laughs> I found it very exciting <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> Happy Halloween, okay. boys and girls. So will we yeah, do so tricks or treats? Rain, are we doing tricks or treats? Both. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, that's uh, but when you, I, I do believe if you take these mushrooms, even if you're just smoking them, which is going to be the mildest form of intaking them, um, that in itself is an aphrodisiac, you know, I can just tell, but, but I take a lot of cordyceps mushrooms and cordyceps are really amazing for your brain and your nervous system as well. Um, but, but the cordyceps, the amanita, the amanita muscaria, the psilocybin, which we didn't really go into, everybody else talks about the psilocybin. So I'll let you, you know, go, go to these other psilocybin experts. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, in conjunction with like reishi and uh, lion's mane, a lot chaga, a lot of these uh, beautiful mushrooms, really good for our brain, really good for our entire nervous system. It's going to add longevity. You know, uh, sexual energy is tied in with longevity in certain practices like tantra. And, uh, and I, and I, and I think that the mushroom medicines are, have been in our cultures, uh, Time through time immemorial, we don't even know how far back our relationship with some of these mushrooms are. We're just rediscovering some of these things and we're always finding new things out. And mycology, the world of mycology in general, has lots of room for expansion and growth because it is such a new science. And I encourage anyone out there interested in these topics to dive in. Um, because there's lots to dive into. Um, this is only one of the, the topics that I am interested in. I am very, very interested in soil health and reversing desertification using our lovely microbes, fungus being the supporter of life on this planet as far as I can tell, you know, and so that has been my um, uh, area of research uh, most strongly, but uh, I, uh, I, I definitely believe that when we are thinking and when we're thinking clearly and we're able to interact with the world in a healthy way, and that starts with how we look at things, how we are interacting and reacting, 
with our world and our environment. But if we can think clearly and make better decisions and feel our connection to it all, I think that's um, a, hu a huge start. You know, you know, ego is is a tool, but you know, th these mushrooms they seem to uh, to really enlighten us in a lot of ways, and uh, or they help us to get back to our roots. <laughs> oh yes, and they form symbiotic relationship with our roots. It's absolutely. <laughs> so there's this. Th we did table it. I'm gonna untable it. Let's untable it. You mentioned <laughs> cordyceps. Mm. And and the so I called it earlier the zombie fungus. So like, tell us tell us why it's called the zombie fungus. Do you know that story? So cordyceps is a very intriguing fungi. Okay, it is weird because it lives on and takes over the bodies of insects and other not just insects, uh, you know, arachnids as well, but um, just like yeasts. If you get like a yeast infection, if you're heavily if you, if you have a lot of yeast in your body, your body will be like, oh, I need sugar, okay? So that's a similar thing, but not exactly. Um, so for instance, there are different, there are hundreds of, of, of species of, um, of cordyceps and, and each one is specific to a different type of bug, if you will. Um, but what it'll do is it will infect its host. And let's just say it's, a, for example, an ant. And it wants to spread its spores, so it tells that ant, I want to go up to the highest leaf on the tree so that it can spread its spores. And so that ant's like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And it just goes as high as it can. And then when it reaches its spot, it connects to the tree or the leaf or whatever. And then the mushroom, the cordyceps, will continue to eat the fungi, the, uh, the, the, the ant, and, um, and then pop a mushroom out of its head. It completely digests the the insect or the arachnid and then um then spreads its spores and right. paul stamets has a uh ha has a patent out uh having to do with using cordyceps as a natural form of pest control um it's not harmful to humans in fact it interacts with us in a completely different way it's really good for us and it's uh in its wild state if you go to um like tibet uh, they, they, the locals will wild harvest it. It's like above 14,000 feet. Um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, what's his name? Daniel Winkler is a guy who, he does the mushrooming tours over there in Tibet. Yeah. And I want to go with him and go see these things. But, um, but the locals will, will harvest it and they, they, it, it, it attaches to a type of larva. It's a type of butterfly. I think it's called the ghost, the ghost. I think it, I can't remember. Anyway, it's the larva of this particular type of, of moth that will is in the ground when it's in its larva, larval state. And that's when the cordyceps attacks it, when it's just a baby. And then the mushroom pops out of its head, but it pops up out of the ground. So you only see like a little finger, you know, above the ground. And so they have to get down low and find these, but they sell them. I think the price is more expensive than gold. Yeah. Which is like, whoa. But there are ways of cultivating these mushrooms in a, in a uh, vegan <laughs> sense. Like you can grow them on specific uh, types of mediums. I have ta I've talked to several of the uh, top growers, like, uh, of, of, um, like that's Cordyceps sinensis. And no one can get it to fruit in a laboratory setting. No one can emulate what's going on in nature. But people have been able to uh, fruit different varieties of cordyceps like cordyceps militaris has been able to be uh, fruited nice. on grains yeah. in a lab and so in, it's interesting nice. so the, the zombie from, well, we have visitors trick I or have my, daughter here. my little daughter's here we are going to go trick-or-treating what i'm going to ask you to do uh -oh. is to make sure you have all your stuff ready your socks it's going to get cold tonight and we're going to go see grandma grandma says she has some surprises uh -oh. You're ready already? Do we want to paint your face too? Yeah, yeah I'm a pa I like to paint faces. I gotta paint my face tonight too. This is gonna be fun. Oh, be and fun. A cat. oh my I god. Got my little witch cat. Little got witch. a witch cat and a trick-or-treater and a witch witchy witch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be eating some cordyceps. I make some amazing cordyceps products. Well, other products too, but I like to extract in honey which everybody does the alcohol extraction or the water extraction or the fermentation. 
but I use honey to extract and it takes a couple of weeks and it's good stuff. <laughs> I sell it here locally and, um, people, uh, yeah, some, some people are addicted to it. So. <laughs> nice. It sounds like a, a pretty healthful addiction. So here's where I'm at. The, oh, the readers here. Hi, we'll let you, we'll let your mom go in just a second. We're going to sign out because this ship, this pirate ship is about to set sail. I think we're going to seek out the, the good tidings of a zombie fungus professional. Maybe we'll get uh, Daniel Winkler on the show soon because he would love to talk about some zombie fungus, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Daniel Winkler is a good one to talk about it with. And then, um, John Holiday. Oh, he John's was the so largest, good. I think he had the largest organic grow up and he did sinensis specifically. He just never could get it to fruit. He sent me all of his papers and I got to read through it exactly what they did and the time frame. And it was all, it's all very interesting. He's also the guy that uh, did the study on the, um, the m women's, I bet, I'm not going to talk about it. Oh, no, it. no. I'll, I'll have to send you an article I wrote about that. I, oh, my um, gosh. Okay, so we're going to have like a, a, holiday. a very witchy Christmas where we talk about some some more Amanitas and Aphrodite so so mushrooms. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And by that time, I'm sure I will have uh, learned even more. <laughs> <laughs> that is too wild. Okay, so yeah, we're we're not even gonna no reveals as to what we will be doing next with Rain Grant, uh, <laughs> RainGrant.com, and you can find her. She's a videographer, and her biggest, most exciting project as of late is Can Mushrooms Save the Planet? Type that into a search engine. Go on Facebook. Find me on Facebook. You'll find that I'm a big fan. And I often share reposting a lot of Rain stuff. And you can find in Theo Radio this episode on podcast media across the nation, across the globe, internationally, and into space. We are on Spotify. We are on um, CastBox FM and theoradio.com and you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram rain and, and if you are interested in learning more about entheogens in general uh i did start the facebook group uh called the durango the psychedelic club of durango <laughs> where i am specifically just posting things about uh well i i do the mushrooms but other people are more interested in other things but um but yeah and so even though that's in durango colorado there's still a lot of good information on that <laughs> on, on that website so yes absolutely so join us on social media and you can find me under hugh t alchemy trevar hughes and you can also find in theo radio across the and across all of the search engines e n t h e o radio and uh yeah let's join the psychedelic club of durango and that was so we just type that into facebook and we find that yes yes um there are two pages one's like a club but that one's just for like um board members but there's one where you can like the page and then um get updates i uh, i try to post relevant information that allows people to dive in further you know so when Will it suit the witch to release her film? So, I have been working on this documentary since 2012. And the year I started working on it, people were already like, when are you gonna release it? When are you gonna release it? And I found out that Louis Schwartzberg, who just released The Fantastic Fungi with Paul Stamets, he started working on that the same year I started working on mine. So, I don't feel so bad that I have yet to get it out, seeing that I am an independent, uh, producer, all self-funded so far. I'm looking at getting some grants so that allow me the time to sit down and edit together. I have so much footage, it's ridiculous. Um, and I have to say stop at some point. So um, yeah, I, I, would, I, I would like to aim for within this next year to have something out there so that I can move on to my next projects, which are also uh, video related, uh, media related. We yes. need to take you. So, you need to take you and the family on tour and have bring you out to California where you can do some talks. I love that, and you know, I think I'm going to be speaking at the Soma Mushroom Camp 
thing. Uh, you know, I put in an application and they have yet to get back to me, but somebody just made it very clear to me. They're like, look, you're on the schedule. I was like, oh, awesome. So I'm going to be doing a couple talks there, it looks like. Um, so this coming cool. January. Yeah. That's up um, in um, Petaluma or is that in Sonoma? It's in, I think it's in Sonoma County, and uh, I haven't hammered out all the details of how I'm getting there yet or anything, but um, I'm going to be doing a talk on entheogens, mushroom entheogens, and then another talk on using fungi to help save the planet. Dude, I will be there with, with Amanitas on. <laughs> Yay! All right. Well, that sounds very exciting to me. <laughs> And come out here and help us with the movement because you know so much about how mushrooms can save the planet and how uh, they can help our brains. Help us with the movement with decriminalizing. In one of my last episodes, Absolutely. we talked about decriminalizing psilocybin. Decriminalize psilocybin in California. It's going to be the next big thing. You kind of sort of already have that in Denver, right? Yes, they had a decriminalized psilocybin movement in, uh, in Denver. It passed, you know, so that is decriminalized within the county only. But not, so, in, not you know. in all of the state. And so I have been waiting for the proper moment to kind of spearhead this because I, I'm kind of like spearheading a lot of things like the uh, Four Corners Mycological Society. I, I got that going. Uh, you know, I, anything mycologically based I'm doing, but I'm very interested in what they did like in Oakland and whatnot, where they, it's like decriminalizing nature yeah. uh, just across the board because psilocybin is very important, but I believe that um, all nature is, uh, is a beautiful thing and should be decriminalized. So I'm looking at what they've been, like uh, New Mexico, which is not very far from where I'm at because we're in the Four Corners area. It's already, uh, it's, it's, it's not illegal to grow psilocybin mushrooms. It's illegal to possess it, <laughs> sell it. It's illegal to intake it, but it is not illegal to grow it. <laughs> so it's a super weird thing. So if but, I have it in me and they can prove it's in me, I'm doing an illegal thing? You know, it's a really weird gray area. And all of these things are very gray, especially when we're talking about decriminalization of something. So if I, throw, up, gray areas. if I throw up a magic mushroom and they test my throw up, then I'm a criminal. So that's where it's really weird. And why would they, why, why would they push it? You know, um, there, so, but, but there, you know, there are corrupt people all over the planet that have like incentives, but, but really I think pushing, I would like to see the entire state of Colorado decriminalized but I'd like to see our entire nation, I'd like to see our entire planet um, get to that point. But it's just one step at a time. We're all doing our part. And, um, but yeah, um, I'm looking at perhaps with some of these meetings uh, with the psychedelic club that I might feel out who is actually interested in hopping on board with that. Because really, I, you know, we can't do these things alone. And right now I'm spearheading a lot of things and I'm looking for people who want to kind of jump on that train with me because I'm just not going to take it on by myself. <laughs> I'm just like, I know that there's people out there that want to jump on the train with me. It's just a matter of connecting with them. So that's Absolutely. what I'm speaking to do. So, you know, reach out to me if you want any information or if you want to be involved in any way. I can usually point people in the right direction regardless if I have the information or not. I can dig up. I have enough contacts and connections, so. Cool. That's, yeah. that's our dear friend, Rain, R-A-Y-N-E, Grant, like the thing that she's looking to receive, everyone. Yes, yes. A grant. And, yes. And we wish her a very happy trick-or-treat session, and, and that lovely lady in the background there that is ready to go to Grandma's house. He's ready. Oh, well, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Um, putting all your energy into all the various things that you're, you're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm really proud of you and I support you and I'm super thrilled and humbled to be, um, be featured on your, your lovely podcast. So thank you for having me. Thanks so much. And a happy Halloween. This is Captain Hugh T. Alchemy signing out. Lovely.